Uh, good morning, friends. I'm Mark Milwee, uh, Trinity, Alabama, uh, Mount View Baptist Church. We want to continue our journey through the Bible today with a uh, message I've entitled, The Antidote for a Troubled Heart. And, and you'll also notice this is part two. Uh, we began part one uh, last week. In fact, uh, during our time together uh, last week, we talked about the fact that twice in John chapter 14, uh, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. He said it first in verse 1 and then again in verse 27. And in verse 27, he adds, and neither let it be uh, afraid. Uh, so uh, he says all this because uh, in chapter 13, uh, Jesus has just told them that one of them will betray him. Uh, he told Peter uh, <clears throat> that he will deny him. And he told all of them that they would desert him. But the most troubling thing of all is he told them that he was not going to be with them uh, very much uh, longer. And then he even added, and you can't go where, where I'm going uh, right now. So uh, I'm sure as he uh, uh, shared this, uh, he was preparing them for his impending uh, death. Uh, but I'm also sure that these words brought a lot of fear and anxiety uh, into their hearts. And so Jesus seeks to soften uh, the blow by offering words of comfort uh, to them. Uh, these words of comfort are a great help to them and I also believe can be a great help to us if we will take them and apply them uh, to our heart and to our life. So uh, we talked about the first of these uh, truths uh, last week. Let me quickly catch you up if you didn't uh, catch that one. Uh, uh, first, Jesus told us we have a home in heaven. Then he said we have access to the Father. And number three, we have the privilege of prayer. So let's talk about these three uh, quickly as we get started. Then we'll go more in depth on the uh, additional three that we find in the latter half of the chapter uh, today. First, Jesus told his disciples, and he tells us that we have a home in heaven. Uh, we know this because of what he says there in verses 2 and 3. He says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be uh, also. And he even tells us how to get there in verse 6 when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father uh, except through me. So uh, Jesus clearly tells us that he's going before us. He's preparing a place for us, and one of these days he's going to come back to get us and take us home there to be with him. So we can find assurance in knowing that we have a home waiting for us uh, in heaven. But also, as the chapter continues, uh, Philip speaks up and, and, and says, uh, Lord, just show us the Father and that'll be enough for us. And Jesus responds by saying in verses, verse 9, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us uh, the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Uh, Jesus is clearly saying that he and the Father are one uh, in this passage. And so what he's, he's comforting us there with is the fact that we have the creator of the universe by our side. There is nothing that we'll ever face in this life that he cannot uh, see us through. So we got the comfort of knowing we got a home waiting for us in heaven. We, we got the comfort of knowing we have access to the Father. The, the creator of the universe is, is on our side. But now number three, we have the privilege of taking all of our cares and concerns uh, to God in prayer. It is reassuring uh, to understand that when my heart is troubled, help is only one prayer uh, away. But Jesus does uh, break down for us the, the, the steps to effective prayer. First of all, he tells us we need to pray in faith. That means we need to pray believing that God can truly answer our prayers. Then Jesus tells us to, to pray in his name. As we talked about last time, that doesn't mean that, you know, it's a kind of a blank check praying. we got to pray according to his will, according to, you know, what would honor him and, and bring glory to him. Uh, what would, you know, a prayer that he would put his stamp of approval on. But when we do that, uh, you know, he, he says he'll answer. And then number three, we need to pray, uh, he says, while living in obedience. Uh, this means, you know, if we want our prayers to be answered, we need to be living a life that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. So we, we uh, can find great comfort and strength when we face troubles and difficulties of life, knowing that we've got a home waiting for us in heaven, Knowing that we've got God the Father by our, our side, uh, access to God the Father, number three, that we can take our prayer concerns to the Lord at any time. And, and so that's where we stopped uh, last time. 
Uh, but today we're going to look at three additional truths from this, uh, th from this chapter. We we've got the Holy Spirit, we got the Father's love, and we have the Father's peace. So let, let's dig in and see what we can uh, learn today. First, we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, look at what Jesus says, beginning in verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells in you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Well, the first thing I want you to notice about the Holy Spirit is this. The Holy Spirit is a gift from the Father in answer to a prayer from the Son. I mean, look specifically at what Jesus prays and says in verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper uh, to be with you forever. So the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in our hearts and lives as a result of a request from the Son to the Father. Jesus has spent his earthly ministry training, guiding, and teaching uh, his disciples. And now he's going to be returning to the Father, and he does not leave them comfortless. Instead, he prays that the Holy Spirit will come uh, to be our helper. Now, your translation might say comforter, it might say helper, it might say advocate, it might say counselor. All of these words are an attempt to a, a, a translate the Greek word paraclete. Uh, this is the word that's used most often in John's gospel to describe the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's used here in this verse. It's going to be used later in verse 26. It's found in John 15, 26, 16, 7, uh, 1 John 2, 1. However, in 1 John 2, 1, it's referring to the intercessory ministry of Jesus on our behalf, but on all other occasions, he uses it to describe the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. So what does this word paraclete mean? It literally means called alongside to assist. Called alongside to assist. Therefore, the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, he's been given to us to assist us, to help us, to comfort us, to console us, to advocate for us. All of these words are an attempt to help us understand uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not work instead of us or in spite of us, but in us and through us. That's what one of my commentaries said, and I really like that. In fact, Warren Wiersbe uh, points out in his commentary that our English word comfort comes from two Latin words meaning with strength. We usually think of comforting or as soothing someone or consoling someone, and to some extent that, that is, of course, true. But, but it's also true that comfort strengthens us to face life bravely, whatever comes our way. Uh, the word encourager is sometimes used in modern translations for this word paraclete, and that's another good choice because the word encourage literally means to put courage into. So Jesus sends us uh, the Holy Spirit to put courage into us, to strengthen us, to help us, uh, to, to, to give us assistance uh, when we face troubles and, and difficulties in life. Uh, we're never alone when we have the Holy Spirit inside our heart. However, this is not the only word that Jesus used uh, to describe uh, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, look carefully again at what he says in verse 17. He says, Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, neither because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Notice here Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. Now, this is very interesting because uh, back up earlier in this chapter, in verse 6, Jesus referred to himself as the truth. And in John 17, 17, that we'll get to in a, in a week or so, uh, Jesus in the high priestly prayer prays, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. So Jesus, the truth, came speaking the truth. And the Spirit inspired the truth, uh, both Jesus and the Word of God. And now the Spirit of truth illumines the Word of truth so that we can understand. Let, let me uh, say that clearly. The Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, uses the Word of truth, the Bible, to lead us to the way of truth, Jesus Christ. Now, let me repeat that because it's so important. The Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, uses the Word of truth, the Bible, to lead us to the way of truth, Jesus Christ. 
as the spirit of truth, of course, cannot lie, do anything contrary to the word of truth. Uh, he has come to dwell inside of us, not, not, uh, not beside us. Uh, look again at what Jesus says. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Uh, we believe that at the point where a person uh, trusts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in our heart and, and life. Uh, earlier in this chapter, Jesus said, um, we, we know the Father because we know Him. Now He says, we know the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of us. So how comforting is this? I mean, uh, I would say it's got to be one of the most comforting things of all to know that I don't have to... Uh, walk through this life alone, I've got the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit to help me. Now look again at what he says in verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Now remember, Jesus is saying all of this because his disciples are troubled. They're upset because he's just told them uh, earlier that uh, he's not going to be with them uh, very much uh, longer. I mean, they don't know it yet, but, but the very next day, He's going to lay down his life uh, for them. Uh, remember, all this happened in the upper room. This is uh, right before they go out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and so Jesus is having this one final time with his disciples. So he, he told them earlier, you know, I'm not going to be with you much longer. Where I'm going, you can't come right now. And, and so this upset them, this troubled them. But now he's, he's saying, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. Now, some see this where he says, um, I'll come to you. Uh, some see that as referring to uh, sending of the Holy Spirit. Others see it as uh, <clears throat> talking about Jesus uh, coming back to them after the resurrection. But it doesn't really matter e either way because we still receive the benefit of not being uh, abandoned. So uh, there's no reason to ever be troubled when we realize that we've got the Spirit of God dwelling inside our life. Well, that brings us to the fifth truth I want to share with you. We've got the Father's love. Uh, look at verse 19. Yet yeah, a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. Uh, Jesus Christ is one with the Father, and we are one with the Father through Christ. So here's how the doctrine of the Trinity works out on a practical basis. God the Father created us and sustains us, but our sin has separated us from a holy God. Therefore, God the Son, Jesus Christ, came and died on the cross to pay the penalty for those sins. And then he rose again, proving his deity once and for all. Uh, this is why he says in verse 19, Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you also will live. He's talking about the resurrection. We've got the hope of resurrection someday, because Jesus rose from the grave. Uh, this is what 1 Corinthians 15 is, is all about. Now God, the Holy Spirit, lives inside of us, helps us to grow in our relationship with God, helps us to understand the things of God. I mean, this is the beauty of the Trinity. One God, three persons working together in unity. But look back at verse 20 one more time. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Again, this entire passage is in the context of Jesus telling his disciples he's going to send them a comforter when he leaves. He says the spirit of truth to live within you. That's how he puts it. Listen, Jesus did not leave us alone when he left earth to return to the Father. Instead, on, on the day of Pentecost, he sent the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, our comforter, and our guide. Again, one God, three persons working together in you. Look carefully what it says. In that day, so he's talking about following the resurrection, you will know that I am in the Father. So, so Jesus and the Father are one, and you are in me. If we trust Christ Jesus as our Savior, then we are in him and, and one with him. And he says, I in you. He is in us because of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that comes to us at the point of conversion. Therefore, again, we, we are never alone. We have access to the Father through the Son by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Now look at verse 21. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. 
We show our love for Jesus by keeping his commandments, by doing what he tells us to do, by being obedient to his word. And as we do this, we are demonstrating our love for him. And, and he says, as a result of our obedience, we will be loved by the Father because we love his one and only Son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus will also love us and manifest himself to us. His love is manifest to us, again, through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, I can say all of this with confidence because of what happens in verse 22. It says, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Well, that's a good question. And it's asked by, it says, Judas Iscariot, uh, not Iscariot. Uh, this was the disciple also known as Thaddeus. So Thaddeus speaks up and he asks a question. He says, Lord, how is it you're going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Now, Jesus had just been explaining all this to them, as I've been trying to do, you know. But he, he still didn't get it. It just didn't click. And, and he didn't really understand. So he speaks up and he asks this question. And I'm so glad that he did because it gave Jesus an opportunity to clarify. And, and look at what he says. Verse 23, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. So let's break this down and look carefully at, at Jesus' response. He says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. So again, we show our love by our obedience. He then says, and my Father will love him. So the Father will love us again because we are showing our love to his one and only Son by being obedient to him. But now look very carefully at the end of verse 23 where Jesus says, And we will come to him and make our home with him. So who is we? I believe Jesus is referring there to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, the word for home is the same word that's used back up in verse 2. It means dwelling place or abode. Jesus is saying that if we'll show our love to him by our obedience, then he, the Father, Holy Spirit, are going to take up residence in our life. And I say that because it's three in one. It's, it's one God, three persons. They do this through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, again, when we're tempted to be worried, troubled, depressed, we need to remember that we have the love of the Father residing in our life through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit because we have committed our lives to his one and only Son. Well, that brings us to the final truth I want to share with you uh, today, and it's that we have the Father's peace. Look at the text, uh, verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Uh, notice first, one of the major roles of the Holy Spirit is to teach us. Uh, Jesus says that the helper, the paraclete, the one called alongside to assist, once he comes, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance everything that I've taught you. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. He's our guide. He's like a life coach living inside my heart that's going to help me understand the Word of God and also remember of what it says. I'm so thankful for the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life, teaching me and helping me to remember the things that I've been taught, helping me to understand the Scriptures. But then look at verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. This is perhaps the most comforting verse in the whole chapter uh, because of the Hebrew understanding of, of the word peace or shalom. Their understanding is just so much uh, more meaningful than our English understanding. I mean, when we think of peace, we think of the absence of conflict or the lack of turmoil. But to the Jewish mind, Peace or shalom was so much more. It implied not only the absence of conflict or turmoil, but also the presence of and the blessing and favor of God upon your life. This is what Jesus means when he says, I give you a peace that the world does not give. 
the peace that Jesus gives is a sense of contentment and wholeness that can only be found through a personal relationship with him. It is the ability uh, to find comfort and strength uh, and, and courage uh, in, in him, even when the world all around you is, is falling apart. This is why he goes on to admonish us not to be troubled in heart, nor to be afraid, because we have the peace of God that passes all understanding living inside of our life. It's due to his indwelling presence. But now look at verse 28. He says, you've heard me say, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would rejoice because I'm going to the father for the father is greater than I. And now I've told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. Jesus basically acknowledges the fact here that he understands that, that they're hurting and, and upset about what he's told them about going away. But he said, if you really understood, uh, you would rejoice over this. He says, because I'm going back to my father, who Jesus says is even greater than I am. In other words, it's to their advantage that he goes away, because once he goes away, the father will send to them the presence of the Holy Spirit to dwell in their lives. Now, he's going to talk more about this uh, later, but he's giving us reasons for hope. He wants them and us to remember <clears throat> so that our faith will be strengthened when we see these things take place. Now, look at how the chapter ends. Verse 30, I will no longer talk much with you. <coughs> Excuse me. For the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me, but I do as the Father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the Father. And then he says, rise, let's go from here. In these verses, Jesus uh, names the two greatest enemies of our spiritual life, the world and the devil. And the good news is that he has overcome both of them. <laughs> Back in John 12, we read, uh, now in the, is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So if Jesus has overcome the devil in the world, and his spirit is now living inside of us, then we too can overcome the devil in the world. In other words, as a believer, the only way Satan can ever get a foothold in my life is if we let him have a foothold in our life. He has already been defeated at the cross. The price has been paid. We can walk in victory and peace and allow <clears throat> the peace of God to rule in our heart and life. Therefore, the next time uh, you're tempted to worry, the next time you're tempted to fret, the next time you're tempted to allow your heart to be troubled, the next time you, you feel some fear beginning to grip your soul, remember the clear teaching of Jesus from this chapter. We got a home waiting for us in heaven. We have the God of the universe by our side. We have the privilege of taking all of our cares and concerns to the Lord in prayer. We have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. We've got the love of the Father because of our love for the Son. And we have the peace that passes all understanding. Claim these promises and let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for watching today.